good morning, good morning, church. Come on in. The conversation must be great out there. Y'all come on in and let's have church. Would you stand to your feet with us? God bless you today. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord. I'm telling you what, God is doing great things in this place today. And so we are going to start this service lifting up our voice together. Those of you that are joining us online today, we are so glad that you are tuning in with us because we believe God has something special for us. Do you know, I learned a long time ago that when you open up, God shows up. Yeah. Come on, He's no respecter of persons. He's good for you like He's good for me. So let's set our gaze heavenward today. Let's determine to seek Him with all of our hearts. And let's declare the word of God over our lives today. Lord, speak your word over us. Your blood is healing every wound. Your blood is making all things new. Your blood, it speaks a better word. Your blood is the measure of my worth. Your blood is more than I deserve. Your blood it speaks a better word. It speaks a better word. We're singing out with love. It's shouting down. Precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. It speaks a better word. Your blood, oh, it's a robe of righteousness. Your blood, it's my hope and my defense. Your blood, come on and speak over your life. Forever covers me. It forever covers me. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. 
runs through the night The precious blood of Christ Speaks a better word It speaks a better word Jesus Christ that cleanses us from every stain. Lord, let your word speak over us today. Lord, we lean in with our hearts to what you're saying. Miracles in the making, a miracle. 
take a moment right now in this service and let's rally in faith around this word that God is speaking over us this is more than a song today can I tell you church this is a foundation that his word is spoken over us and it's a better word than any word I can come up with it's a better word than anybody could motivate you with it is thus saith the Lord of hosts over your life every promise is ours in Christ Jesus it is yes and amen in the church. And so I want to challenge you right now. We're going to just take a moment and we're going to lift up our voices to the Lord together. Listen, there is power in agreement. There's power in agreement. I, I understand we're living in, a, in an hour when everything you do, you have to weigh risk versus reward. Some of you, you've been contemplating that decision this week, even about your Thanksgiving dinner. Am I getting together with people? Am I not? I'm weighing the reward versus the risk. And, and, and I understand. That's where we're all at. We do it every day. Can I just tell you, you chose right by getting in the house of God today. Amen. You chose right. Because there's power in agreement. And even for those of you that are online right now, lock in with us in this moment. Because we're going to lift our voices together. We're going to make some noise in this place. And we're going to call on God to establish His Word. The Bible says that Jesus is the spotless Lamb that we see in the Old Testament. And when the blood of the Lamb was covered over the doorpost, disease, sickness, and death could not enter that house. Some of you need to just draw a bloodline around your family in prayer today. So we're going to do it right now. We're going to just, in the name of Jesus, we're going to decree every promise is ours. And they're going to sing this over us again, that God's Word is settled today. Come on and lift your voice with me. Father, thank you that right now, God, your presence is in this place. God, we receive every promise. Every promise is ours in Christ Jesus. And today, Lord, we pray in the Spirit. We pray, God, that strongholds will be broken that our bodies would be made whole, that our marriages would be healthy, that our children would be saved. Every promise is ours today. Have your way, God. Come on and call down heaven, come to earth. In my life, your word. We speak against the mountain of sickness. We speak against the mountain of coronavirus. God, we say it has to be removed into the sea. In Jesus' name, Lord, by faith, we speak life. We speak health. We speak wholeness. We speak deliverance from bondage and addiction. In Jesus' name, Lord, turn around financial miracles for your people. God, in Jesus' name, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in our lives as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. By your stripes, I am Hallelujah. Come on and lift it up. We're made whole. Jesus. Even in the midst of the storm, God, stand on the bow and speak in peace. The storm, you, are peace. you are peace, Jesus. And your love won't let me go. You have spoken, and I know that it is so. 
Come on, declare that over your life. He has spoken. You have spoken, and I know that it is so. Come on, let's give him praise today. If you believe his word is established, come on, we can do better than that, church. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated today. My goodness, it's good to be in God's house with you. As you can see, we are already a little excited about Christmas. Advent season starts next week, but we wanted to go ahead and get the decorations up. We needed a little extra celebration this season. We are glad you're here, and we're going to get ready to receive our tithe and offering in just a moment. Uh, let me just say thank you to all of you that have contributed. We have got piles and piles of coats and gifts uh, back there and food for the food pantry. And many of you have been giving uh, to missions above your tithe and offering to help us bless some of our missionaries in this Christmas season. So thank you for that. Watch these announcements as we prepare for our giving. Hey everyone, I'm Val and I want to welcome you to Wrightsville Assembly of God. We are about to receive our tithes and offerings and you can find ways to give at the bottom of the screen. And as you prepare to give, check out these announcements. We're so glad that you've joined us for church. If you're new with us, we would love to get to know you. Would you do us a favor and fill out our digital connect card? You can do this by scanning the QR code in the backs of the seats or by going to wrightsvillechurch.com slash connect and filling out this brief form. We would love to get to say hi to you this week and help you get plugged in at the church. We are in the middle of our second annual Thanks for Giving campaign. Throughout the month of November, we've been collecting food for the local food pantry, gently used and new toys for Project Toy Box, coats and blankets for the homeless, and funds for missions. The desire behind our Thanks for Giving campaign is to be a blessing to our community. We want to encourage you throughout the rest of the month of November to pray about giving above and beyond your tithes and offering to our missions fund. During the Christmas season, we want to be a blessing to our missionaries. If you're giving in person, you can designate your donation on the giving envelopes. And if you're giving online, you can select the missions fund. Next Sunday evening, we're going to be joining Wrightsville Borough for their annual tree lighting ceremony. Come out for a fun night with carols led by kids in the community free hot chocolate and coffee, treats for the kids, and a visit from Santa. We hope you'll make plans to join us in kicking off the Christmas season with our community. Ladies, we want to invite you to join us for our annual Women's Ministry Christmas Breakfast on Saturday, December the 12th. All ladies, youth, age, and older are invited for a fun morning of breakfast, a gift exchange, and a special Christmas message from Alicia Ayala. Everyone is encouraged to bring a breakfast dish to share and a $5 gift if you would like to participate in the gift exchange. We always have so much fun at our Christmas breakfast and we hope you'll make plans to join us. If you plan on attending, please sign up at the Info Center today. That's it for this week. As our ushers get ready to receive the offering, we want to let you know that you can get connected and stay up to date with what's going on at Wrightsville Assembly of God by liking us on Facebook, following us on Instagram, checking out our website, and grabbing a monthly bulletin from the Info Center. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for church. We hope you have a great day. All right. Who's ready to get into the Word this morning? That's so awesome. Save the best for last. So happy. All right. I'm Pastor Chris. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the Connections Pastor here at the church, and I'm going to be bringing the word to you here in the building and online. Uh, I just want to encourage you, if you are online, let us know in the comments section that you're trekking with us, and if there's anything that speaks to you, I hope at least one thing will speak to you, because <laughs> I've taken some time to dig out the word here this week. And uh, first of all, thank you, Pastor Aaron, for this opportunity. I need to make sure that I do that every single service, because this pulpit is certainly a sacred place, and any time that we open this word is important. I'm surprised you let me do that, considering my fishing stories I tell from up here. <laughs> Honestly, all three services. I got, I got every service to make that fish a little bit bigger, right, with three services. You know, as we were talking about preparing for today, you know, our pastor, in a way that only he can, he's really good with alliterations, and um, I don't know if you've noticed, but the last couple weeks in this Upside Down Kingdom series, he's had 
the alliterations of L, and so he had originally asked me to just preach about giving this week, um, but you just did that a second ago, so thank you so much for giving. No, I'm just kidding. No, but the Bible does say to lend to receive. It, it's upside down. It really is upside down, and so if pastor was preaching today, he would be preaching on lend to receive, but Pastor Aaron is not preaching today. <laughs> And so he, I, and I so appreciate this, Pastor, has allowed me just to share what I feel like God is saying right now. I really do feel that this is a word for the church right now in this season. And I don't say that um, willy-nilly. I don't just like throw that out there. I really believe that God has been stirring my heart with something. But I thought about somebody else who probably should have preached this message. And I want to show you a picture of that. And hopefully online they can see that as well. Talk about the upside down kingdom. That boy spends more time upside down than he does right side up. You know, he has the audacity to tell me that his neck hurts <laughs> while he's like that. But let me show you the next one. My wife didn't know I did this, but watch this knee. Oh, yeah, slow mo. Oh, yeah. Boys, we got in trouble for that, for the record. Uh, so I don't know if you saw in that first picture, though, he just had surgery on his tooth and. Uh, so his front tooth is missing. But I, I told my wife, I said, man, we didn't need to wait for surgery. I'm sure it was going to get knocked out at some point. That's, that's just how it works. But just thinking about the whole upside down kingdom and, and looking at everything upside down, it really is an upside down world right now that we're living in. But the word that God's been stirring on my heart is this. One of the most upside down parts of the kingdom is our belief in the words of this book. This is really heavy on my heart, and I need to release this burden to you, and I've already done it over two services, so you're about to get the third best portion of it. <laughs> but I do believe that, that that is so upside down. You know why? We believe in absolute truth. We believe there is a such thing as absolute truth. You know, the, the world would say it's human reason, right? That, 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 that is truth. We can decide what our truth is going to be, but we really believe in the words of this book and the fact that there is a such thing as absolute truth. And I want to put up this verse. Psalm 119.89 says, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. It's a powerful word. You know, there's been over 5 billion copies of this book sold. Five billion copies, and that does not include the ones that have been given away to people. This is the most read book ever in human history, even more than Harry Potter, as surprising as that is. It's amazing, this book and how powerful it is. I was eating uh, a dinner, my friend Fred, he's a retired old minister, and he says that I can call him old for the record. Uh, we were having dinner together, and I love just hearing his stories and the things that he shares. You know, he's like one of those guys that's like a 15-year-old that's trapped in like an 80-year-old body. You ever met somebody like that? Like, hey, are you ever going to grow up? He's like, nope, <laughs> nope. But he was telling me about a story one time about one of the churches that he pastored, and it was here in Pennsylvania that his church burned to the ground. His church burned down. And he said whenever he got to the church, it was pretty incredible because the blaze was so hot. People couldn't get close enough for like, a half a mile away, he said it was just so hot. And actually, the, the uh, fire department had come, and they told him, well, this must have started around 6 p.m. because of how hot these flames are. And he said, we've been here, we were here at 9 p.m. So there's no way that that could have happened because we were here at a prayer service literally just earlier until 9 p.m. There were two things that were left in the ashes of that church. Number one was the cross the metal cross. Number two, an open Bible on the pulpit. Everything else burned to the ground around it. Now you might say, and I got a firefighter in the building, right? You might say that, uh, you know, when the, when the book is closed, it's hard for a book to burn, you know, but, but the book was open. The book was open and laying on a wooden pulpit, and that stayed standing. So I just want to encourage you today, as we dig into this word, this is a powerful word. It really is. You know, in uh, the Assemblies of God, and you might not know this, but we have 16 fundamental truths, and our very first fundamental truth is this. The scriptures, both the Old and the New Testament, are verbally inspired of God and are the revelation of God to man, the infallible, authoritative rule of faith and conduct. We lean Here's your L alliteration. <laughs> Lean on the word and not on our human understanding. 
Lean on the Word and not our human understanding. And that, that would sound pretty crazy. I mean, 1 Thessalonians, though, let's look at this. 1 Thessalonians 2 says, And we also thank God continually because when you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as human word, but as it actually is the Word of God, which is indeed at work within you. So if you're taking notes, here's number one. Accept the Word. Here's, here's an upside-down kingdom thing. Accept this word. It's not just folklore. It's not just good teaching. It's not just good morals. It's not just a historical book. We actually believe that this is God's revelation of himself to us. Now, I don't dispute the matter that you know, we have human reason. Okay, I, I'm not telling you to check your brain at the door. Please don't do that. There's a lot of things that, especially in Scripture, that says are very logical and rational that we need to do. In fact, there are multiple books of the Bible that are considered wisdom literature, okay? So, so be wise. <laughs> do smart things, okay? I feel like I need to say that in this world. I mean, common sense, I feel like, has gone out the window sometimes. Is that just me? Okay. Yeah, I just lost all my credibility there. But the Bible says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and your mind. We're supposed to love God with our understanding. We're supposed to love God with our mind. Rationality is not a sin, but rationalism is a sin. See, rationalism is the belief that the highest authority is human reason. It contends that human genius will eventually unlock all the secrets of the universe and lead to perfect life, peace, health, and wealth. I don't know if you've realized, but we're kind of going backwards from that. <laughs> we're in the middle of a pandemic, and science, as good as it has been, has not been enough. It hasn't been enough. I don't know if we think that we're going to get to this utopia moment, that there's going to be perfect peace and perfect unity. We're all going to sing Kumbaya with Pastor playing the piano, and it's going to be great, right? But that's, that's not our reality. You know, there's a lot of people that say science explains everything. Ultimately, science will explain everything, so we don't need God. I actually found a recent report out of the American Association for Scientific Advancement on all of the experts in the scientific field, and they found this. Over half of the scientists believe there is a God. Over half. You know, we tend to think that, that if you believe in science, you know, that everybody's atheist then, and, and, and that's not the case. Actually, Alan Rex Sandage his name was, was the successor to Edwin Hubble of the Hubble telescope. It is my science, he said, that drove me to the conclusion that the world is much more complicated than can be explained by science. It's actually science that pointed him to God. <laughs> you know, I, I grew up, I, I love getting to know things. I'm a perfectionist. I needed th things to be in order and everything. But I remember when I grew up, I used to have these dreams, these night terrors. I was like seven or eight years old. And there were these legitimate night terrors I would have for like four years where I would wake up during the night in sweats and freaking out. And I can remember vividly those night terrors, even to this day. So I, was, I was a little seven, eight-year-old just laying in my bed and I would fall asleep. But in my dream, I feel like I would wake up in my dinosaur sheets and everything, which my wife won't let me have dinosaur sheets, so. <laughs> but we'll get there. Um, <laughs> But I'm in the dinosaur sheets, and I can't go anywhere. I'm being pushed around. I'm, I'm trying to get out, and I can't. And then my vision, there's, there's a wall in front of me, my, my green wall that had a dinosaur mural beside it. And, and I would, I was in the dinosaurs, okay? I'm talking about science here. So, so then I was zooming into the wall. My, my vision would zoom into the wall to the point where, and I'm, I can't describe this as a 7- and 8-year-old. It was only later in life that I could describe it. I would zoom into the wall to the point where I would see, like, the paint chips, it's probably because my family are painters. That's probably what it is. I just figured it out. Three services, it took me to figure that out. But I would zoom into the wall, and I would get to the point where I would see the paint chips, the chemistry of the paint, and then I would be so deep inside that I don't know what anything is, and I would have this intense fear overtake my body, and I'd wake up in sweats, screaming and crying. Now, to me, there are two things from that. Number one, I couldn't control it. I was stuck. I couldn't move. Number two, I couldn't understand it. And I have given my life to understanding things. I, I went to school to go to, to be a doctor, actually. I, I was going to go to medical school, took my MCATs and everything, and God took me in a different direction. But, but science was my life. I love to know how things work. I love to know that. But Blaise Pascal, he was a child prodigy, 
and a leading defender of the scientific method said, faith doesn't explain everything, but neither does science. At the macro and the micro levels of the universe is mystery. There's mystery. You know, this book is the canon of 66 books written over 1,600 years by over 40 authors, and yet it tells a perfectly, a perfectly capable story of our God. I want you, if you do have a Bible, to open up to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to be there, and then also in 2 Timothy. We may, we may be able to sneak in there a little bit. But I want to show you a verse that we've, you've probably heard. If you've been at church in any length of time, you've probably heard this verse. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is what? I guess I'm used to the youth services. They talk back to me. For the word of God is? And what? Sharper than any two-edged sword, it penetrates even to the dividing, listen, even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You know, I think sometimes we stop short on that verse. I've heard that all the time. For a long time, people will be quoting that verse and it'd say, For good, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. We stop there. But why? It, it's the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. You know, we love those verses that are like, oh, the sword of the Spirit. It's so awesome. We just whip out our sword, and, and we're all excited to do that. But now this is powerful, though. Think about this. I, I've dissected animals, okay? Sorry, PETA. I, but I've dissected animals in my classes, and, and I've, I've cut down in all the way down to the nerves and looked at all the small little pieces. But this is saying that the Word of God actually cuts even deeper than that to your soul and your spirit. Now, I want you to understand this. Your person is actually made up of three things, a trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. And so your body, I mean, we can all, I can see the bodies in the room, and I'm hoping there are some bodies online as well. But we, we can see the body, but the soul and the spirit are internal. See, the soul is your psyche, or suke, it's called. It's your inner life irrespective of your spiritual experience. It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. But here's the thing about your soul. It's selfish. Your soul is selfish. I mean, I don't think I really need to tell you that. I think we all kind of know that. Our minds, our will, and our emotions. Let me just talk about the mind, for example. Like the mind, it's, it's a supercomputer. I mean, there will never be a computer like our minds. It's incredible what our minds can do. I mean, the fact that I can remember what I ate for breakfast yesterday, and, you know, that's sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, the fact that I can pull up these thoughts, and, but basically our mind is based out of our experiences, right? The things that we've experienced, we can pull up those things. I'll give you an example. When we went to name my daughter Eden, we went to name her, and I know parents have had this struggle. It's, it's hard to name your kids, but here's what we did. My wife said, well, why don't we name her Mackenzie? I said, I don't know. I knew Mackenzie in high school. I grew up. You know? You know, or, or maybe, you know, let, let's name her Miranda. I don't know. That, that lady that works at the church nursery, I don't know about her. Shout out to you, Miranda. Thank you for being in the nursery. But that's what we do, right? Why would I do that? It's based out of my experiences. It's based out of the things I've already seen, the things I already know. So we named her Eden, and we used a Y instead of an E so that we'd be different, right? But, but that's, that's the struggle with our minds, what happens there. But then there's our spirit, our pneuma. It's the spiritual dimension of our being in relation to God. Here's the thing. The soul must submit to your spirit. Your soul must submit to your spirit. Now, I'll, I'll show you why. The next verse, the next verse, Hebrews 4, 13. We got to look at this. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. And that's already pretty powerful. Listen to this. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, there's two words there. I, I want to show you this. I'm really nerdy, okay? But God woke me up in the middle of the night and told me to look up these words. The middle of the night, 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm looking up Greek. <laughs> Talk about a nerd. But it says, is uncovered and laid bare. I looked up the meaning of those words. That word uncovered actually is the meaning of taking the body off of the soul. 
uncovering the soul. And, and so that's what happens. When you're reading the Word of God, it, it, God's sight, He sees everything. It's like me chopping into the, those animals and looking in and, and finding God opens up our lives. He's able to look into our soul. But here's the next thing. This is nuts. Trache lizo. Trache lizo. You're probably saying, bless you, Chris. <laughs> this is a military term. It's used once in Scripture. A military term. Trache. Trachea, your throat. It's talking about your windpipe. And so this word, here's the picture. Let me give you the picture. It's somebody taking somebody's hair like this, grabbing their head, and exposing their throat. That's what that word means. You can, you can look it up, Strong's Concordance. I mean, that's what that word means. It's literally the, uh, somebody that's coming up to somebody going like this, boom. You, you, you take, here's what it says, to seize by the throat or neck, to expose the gullet of a victim by killing it. So here's what the word of God does to your inside when you read the word. It's to open up your soul and go, chop. The Holy Spirit, when you submit to the Spirit, that's why I said there's a battle. Here's the thing, when you are, when you are saved, you are a new creation. Well, when I, got, when I became a new creation, I thought, well, I'll lose some 50 pounds. I gained more. You know, like, but, but that's because, yes, we are dead in our spirit, and our spirits are brought to life. And so, yes, you are a new creation on the inside. Your spirit is brought to life. But then what happens? Your spirit and your soul, they just start doing this with each other. That's why you felt that, that feeling sometimes when you're digging into the Word and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, that doesn't sit well with me. And, and you're starting to wrestle with that feeling. God's Word awakens and strengthens His life and His Spirit inside of us. It's like looking into a mirror, James says. Like looking into a mirror and going, oh my goodness. And then, but you walk away and you forget yourself. No, you, you look into that mirror and you see what God says. But here's the thing. We know the Word as the sword and the Spirit. You know, we, we love Ephesians 6. I didn't know Pastor was going to get up and share that this morning, and, and I'm going to Ephesians 6 for a second because we talk about the armor of God. We love those verses, right? Those militant verses that are like, put on the full armor of God, you know, and take the sword of the Spirit and, and go after everybody, right? We, we just can't wait to go after the enemy with those verses. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But are you willing to fall on your sword? Are you willing to fall on your sword? It's the word of God. It says that that word cuts us open and works on the inside. And see, we take those verses and, and we use it like, like military weapons. Like, I can't wait to throw the word of God at somebody, right? Well, here, here's what it says, though. I, I, again, I'm, I'm going to do some teaching. Can you take that? Kids, can you take it? Some teaching? Yeah, yeah. So the, the word. There's three words for word. Graphe, which is like the, the, the actual book, like the, the pages, like the pages and the written, the written language. But then after that, there's logos, which is like the, the message of the word, the, the actual stuff inside of here, the content of this. But then there's rhema. See, you talked about logos when we talked about, you know, Hebrews 4. It's like it's able to pierce. It's the logos word of God. But rhema is different. Rhema is the Holy Spirit bringing to our attention the application to a current situation. Highlighting the Word of God for a certain moment. I'll give you an example. God, I've, I've read the book of Nehemiah a number of times now, but there, when I first got into ministry, God spoke to my heart, Nehemiah 1, which is Nehemiah, he's going back to Jerusalem and he's re rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And, and it was like one of those words that, that just jumped off the page. I'd read it before, but it was like God took that word and goes, that's for you, Chris, right now. That's for you. Well, I thought that meant that I would rebuild the walls, the spiritual walls where I was at, and I was all excited about that. But then I came here, and I rebuilt these walls. I rebuilt physical walls. It's like, I look at God, like, God, you're so funny as I'm like up on a scaffold working on stuff. Like that, that's how God's word works though. He gives you direction. It's like for that moment. But here's the thing. The rhema word is what it talks about when it talks about picking up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 
That's the rhema word. That's the current application. But here's what I see in, in the church right now. People are taking the sword of the Spirit. Like, I'm going to get you now. Ha ha, gotcha, right? Ha, right? Yes, that's what it looks like in the church right now. People are taking the Logos word, which you got, this thing is sharp. This, this thing is powerful. They're, they're taking the Logos word, but it's the rhema word that is powerful for the moment that we're in. And so we're taking the rhema word, the current application, that's how we fight our spiritual battles, is to use the word correctly. To use it correctly. You know, even in 2 Timothy, even if you turn there for a second, 2 Timothy 2.15, he's talking to Timothy about false prophets. He's talking to him about false prophets, and he says this, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, listen to this, and who correctly handles the word of truth correctly handles the word of truth. You know what that tells me? There's an incorrect way to handle the word of truth. It's powerful. You know, we got people slicing and dicing everybody up, right? But here's the thing. You, you, got, you have to accept the word first. Here's what happens. We don't allow the word to go in. We let it bounce off of us and shoot it off at somebody else. It's the right now word. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture I'm going to say that again. All Scripture. I'm going to say it one more time. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And usually that's where we stop. But the next verse. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, we love that. We're like, oh, train, tra let's train people up in righteousness, right? Rebuke people and correct people. And No, he's actually talking to Timothy. He's actually saying, Timothy, this is for you. Isn't it funny how we can read the word of God and we can think it's for somebody else? Yeah. <laughs> right? This word is for me. Pastor Chris, it does surgery on my heart. It's powerful. You know, I think that's the danger today is, we, you know, we take the verse of the day, like a cafe menu, right? It's like, oh, I'll take that one today, <laughs> right? My wife always says I get the most expensive meal. For the record, it's always the best meal. Am I right? Earl, you're smiling because you know you shared those meals with me. But here's the problem is we can't let the soundbite culture work its way into our understanding of Scripture. There are algorithms on social media. I don't know if you know about this, but there are algorithms that help to come up with stuff that you're going to look at. And so over time, you become biased in a direction because you're only seeing certain things. See, but the problem is that's happening with the Word of God. There are algorithms that are showing us the Word that is biased to our opinion. Let me, trust me, I like the lovey-dovey verses, okay? That's my personality. That's, that's just how I'm, I'm made, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just love that. I, I'm biased towards some verses. I like this verse a little bit better than I like this verse. But you can't take the verse. It says all of Scripture is useful. All of it. You know, here, here's a verse that you can share on Instagram here today, kids. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, I've never seen that come up in a daily devotion. <laughs> you know, have you ever noticed that? Greet each other with a holy kiss. Actually, five times in Scripture it says that. But we haven't made doctrine out of it, have we? Well, maybe we have. That's, I joked around. That's how we got to three services. <laughs> People were like, oh, that's how they're doing it. Greet each other with a holy kiss. Or maybe scaring everybody away. But that, that's called eisegesis. When you're, when you're looking into the Word based on your opinions and your thoughts, when you start with human reason and you begin to look at the Word through that, frame of mind, but exegesis is actually reading what the author meant. You start with the word of God. I can give you a perfect example of somebody in the Bible who dealt with this too. Jonah. Jonah and the Ninevites, right? The word of God came to him. God is going to slay them. God's going to take them out. And so he goes and he tells them, you know, God says repent or he, he's going he's gonna to come after you. Well, he didn't realize they would repent. And here's, here's the verse. Jonah 4.1, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. This was the word of the Lord, 
And you, and you look at Jonah, and he's like, well, God, I, I knew that you were like compassionate stuff, but I wanted like that, that judgment. I wanted like that, that righteousness, right? I wanted the fire from heaven. But God said, why are you angry? Because you know that I'm also compassionate? It, and that's what, that's what we can't do with the word. I, I want to encourage those of you that have read the word for years and years with a verse out of Galatians chapter 2 where the apostle Paul says, I went and I saw Peter and I opposed him to his face because he was wrong. Think about that. This is 14 years after Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost. Peter started the church. Peter was the first one to get up and preach. And 14 years later, Paul says he was wrong. I don't know what you've been learning from Scripture or the teachers that you've learned from or any of those things. It is very possible today for you to still be wrong. I don't know how you grew up. I grew up Catholic. Um, I don't know if you grew up Pentecostal. I don't know if you grew up Methodist or, or whatever denomination, or maybe you had no sense of church whatsoever, but it's this word that is powerful. You could be wrong. You know what I realize, especially in this pandemic, I have a lot to learn. But mostly, I have a lot to learn about myself. See, I think there's so many people who want to prove rather than improve. See, when you improve, you're asking this question, what am I becoming? Here's the second thing. Do the word. So the upside down kingdom, I mean, it's just, it's already crazy upside down that we would even believe this word. But here's, here's really upside down, doing this word, actually practicing this word. Jesus said at the end of his Beatitudes, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, this most incredible sermon of all time, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, accepts these words and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. We are called to input the word and then have an output. But you have to ask yourself, what is the output supposed to be? What is the output supposed to be? Is the output supposed to be the ability to put, point out false doctrine, point out false teachers? Or is the reason for us to understand this word to love one another? to serve one another. I mean, in 2 Timothy, even if you look earlier in, in uh, chapter 2, chapter 2 there, he says this multiple times. He says all kinds of things. Don't quarrel about words. He's talking about when he's speaking to false prophets, false teachers. Don't quarrel about words. Avoid godless chatter. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. He's talking about this. And then he goes on to say, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. Opponents must be, now listen, <laughs> opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Jesus said, how were people going to know they're my disciples? How? How? Because they love one another. He's about to go to the cross. He knows he's going to the cross, and he says, how, how are they going to know that you're my disciple? How, how are people going to know? Because you're going you're to love. You're going to love one another. You're going to serve one another. He got down on his hands and knees, and he washed the feet of his disciples. I've washed my son's stinky, dirty feet. I don't want to wash some feet of the, some disciples, right, that have been on those dirty streets. That's what Jesus said. This is going to be what's going to prove that you're my disciples. But don't get it twisted. I can get pretty legalistic. I'm, I, like I said, I, I'm OCD. I'm a perfectionist. I need things to like line up symmetry. I, I need things to be symmetrical. It just like, it eats away at me. And, and when I first started reading this word, when I first started digging in, when I knew that I, that I was moving into vocational ministry, I started to read this word like never before. I started to study this word and man, it, it was so powerful. But then I began to see all the areas where my family doesn't add up. I mean, my son, don't flip on the couch. Listen to your father, right? That's what the Bible says, son. <laughs> Listen to your father. Honor your father and mother by not busting your, your ears and stuff. 
But th- that's, that's what I did, though. I put these, these expectations on my family. I was like, uh-uh, we better... Sh-. Britt, look, this is what the Word says. This is what the Word says. We're supposed to get better at this. No, we're not doing right. We should be doing this. Not, son, no, you're supposed to be doing this. Eden, no, you should be doing this. And, and all of a sudden, my wife one day comes to me, and she goes, Chris, I want you to stop all this studying stuff. And she said, and I said, why? Maybe because you lost the love that you used to have for people. You're losing the compassion and the love that you used to care about people. See, legalism is obeying the letter of the law while violating the spirit of the law. I just want to encourage you with one thing before I move to the last thing. And my encouragement to you is to do the word before you feel it. Do the word before you feel it. You know, if, if, you, if you're waiting until the moment that you feel something, you've waited too long when it comes to the word of God. And I know it's a challenge. I know that's a challenge. But that, that's our soul. That's the feelings. That's our emotions that get to us. And then here's the third thing, though. We love the word. We love the word. So we accept the word, right? We accept it and, and we take it and we allow it to do the surgery on our hearts. We, we do the word and we have an output of the word. But then the last thing is we love this word. We love this word. We have a, we have a relationship with this word, which sounds crazy. I mean, that is totally upside down to the world, right? That I would say that I love this word. There's something about this. I mean, you, you asked my wife, there, there was a day when I lost my job, everything was going wrong. We were about to have my son gray. We had no income. It was just a mess. And she goes, hey, Chris. I said, yeah. She goes, your Bible's been sitting there on the table for like two weeks and you haven't picked it up. I said, I'm busy. I'm bu-. She's like, for the first time in your life, you don't have a job that you can just do what God's calling you to do and pick up your Bible. Since that day, I have not put this sucker down. I love this word. I love it. You know what? Jesus is the word. I think sometimes we've separated that out. Like, no, no, I'm good. Like, I'm going on reading that. I got Jesus, right? I'm friends with Jesus. No, this is the word. Jesus is the word. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word died on a cross for us. That word died for your sins and my sins and then resurrected again and then ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father, the word of God. And we have his word right here. If if you think it's just, just there in the Gospels, go to the end of the book. Go to Revelation 19. It says, he is dressed in a robe dipped with blood. His name is the word of God. That's his name. I mean, he's coming in on a horse, and and he's about to slay Satan finally and forever, throw him into hell where he deserves to be. That's literally what is going to happen at the end of the days, and it says that there's a sharp sword that's going to be coming out of his mouth. It's the word of God, and we should love this word. John 5, 39 and 40 Jesus is talking to some people, and this is my encouragement to some of you. Jesus is talking to some people that had studied this book their entire lives. Their entire lives. And he says this, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I've known a lot of people that know a lot of this word. I've known a lot of people, there are scholars out there that have devoted their lives to understanding this book, but have missed it. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here as I close. It's about knowing and loving the author of this book. I want to encourage you, all of Scripture is God-breathed. All of it. How many people read Amos this week? Okay. Online, if you read Amos, great job. (laughs) How many people read Hosea? Right? 
All of it. All of it is God breathed. And I want to encourage you, devotions are great. I mean, those are great opportunities, but, but don't allow that to be the only method that you get this word. Would you open up this word for yourself? Would you dig into it? And I don't care how long you've been serving Jesus. You can still learn something else. You can still learn something more. I want to show you one last verse. Psalm 119, 103. How sweet your words are to my taste sweeter than honey to my mouth. I mean, David is writing these, Psalm 119, it's amazing about the word, and he's saying like, I love this word. This word gives me nourishment. I, I love everything about this word. I'm gonna share something with you guys that many of you probably don't know. Very few in the room do, but I've been saved for about nine years, okay? I've been sober for six. So, so what happened there? <laughs> um, some things God did supernaturally. When it came to drinking alcohol, I would get sick. After I got saved, I would get sick from drinking alcohol. It would actually make me sick. Like I'd, I'd get red and, and I'd need to go to the restroom. And my, man, I've just... I, I just couldn't do it anymore. Even if I wanted to, I could not drink it because it would literally physically make me ill. But there are some other things that didn't drop off right away. I wish I could tell you that everything got taken away in a moment, but it was, my, it was the Spirit of God that had to wrestle with my soul. And then I realized that it's a stronghold. That's what a stronghold is. It, it's your mind holding on to something and since sixth grade, I had these issues. 17 years of those issues. Those are some deep-seated problems. And you know what it was? This word. I had to wrestle with this word. I don't know if you ever had an experience like, like Jacob did in Genesis 32, wrestling with God. He was wrestling with Jesus. And he's like, I will not let go until you bless me. I, I've had to wrestle with this word. I've had to wrestle with it. There are some things in this word that are just not comfortable for me. And, and, and I would read this word. I would eisegete this word and I would look at it in relation to what I wanted. And, and I would deal with it. And my wife would say, you shouldn't be doing that anymore. I said, I, it, I mean, when I read this, like I, I see though that like, it's not that bad. And, and I've got my life together over here, right? Like, and she, she would say, no, I, I don't read that. And I have to see the verses that say, be sober, be alert. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. I would have to look at those words and I'd have to go, do I believe that? Do I believe this? Do I really take this to be the Word of God? And if so, I have to wrestle with these things. I'm going to shoot out a couple things here. I'm not, I'm not going to go over them, but my goal is that you would look at this stuff. Holy Spirit baptism. Women in ministry, homosexuality. Some of these things that are tough, tough, tough things. And this is, this is tough. This thing does surgery on your heart. Don't think because you've, you've read it for 40 years that, that you've got it all together and you've got it all figured out. No, there's more for you to learn. There's more for God through his spirit to reveal to you. He's going to give you the rhema word of God for the moment that you need it. I'd ask if you would all stand with me here as we close. And I just want to ask you a couple questions. And this is between you and God, not even your neighbor. Do you believe this word? Do you believe this word? Do you believe that it's the authoritative rule of God in your life? Are you handling correctly the word of God? Are you handling it correctly? Do you love this word? Do you love this word? Are you willing to wrestle with this word? Trust me, at the beginning of this pandemic, I was crying like a big old baby. There were things that I just felt like, I was like Jacob, just wrestling with 
issues and problems and I was trying to point it all out at everything else. Like it's everything else's fault, this pandemic's fault. It's the fact that I got to look into a camera and do an Instagram live. Who wants to do that, kids? Like, I, I don't want to do this stuff. I had to dig into the word. I had to go like, oh, man, what does the Lord want? What does the Lord want? What is he trying to say through all of this? I had to wrestle with God. I mean, I was out in the woods, like crying, like big old baby going on a hike. I'm glad nobody else was on the trail. (laughs) But I was was wrestling with this word. I just, I wanna pray for you in this moment. And I wanna encourage you, we're gonna lift up the the course of this song again about this word. And I want you in your own heart to decide about this. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you that, Lord, Pastor Aaron allowed me to just share what I believe that you've put on my heart for a time such as this. Lord, I thank you that you continue to move by the power of your Holy Spirit. And God, right now, I pray, Lord, through your spirit that you would illuminate the words in between the words. God, that you would illuminate, Lord, the 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 letters that are in between the letters because there are parts of your word, God, that that are a mystery to us. There are parts that we have not yet experienced, but God, it doesn't mean it's not true. So God, for that individual right now that has been wrestling, God, I pray that they would open up your word and that you would speak a rhema word to their hearts, God, that they would be able to combat the schemes of the enemy, which are spiritual. They are not carnal. God, right now, Lord, would, would your spirit just overtake our soul? God, would your, would your spirit, would we allow your spirit in, God, to do the surgery that needs to be done in this season? God, we give thanks for your word. We thank you that it's a Thanksgiving season, and we can thank you, Lord, that you have given us your revelation of who you are. More than that, Lord, you've revealed who we are through this. God, for that individual that's out there right now that that does not have a relationship with you, Jesus, I pray right now, God, you would awaken their souls, God, because I believe that it's your spirit, Lord, that draws people, not anything I say. God, I thank you, Lord, that this word says that you died on the cross to fulfill the scriptures, that you rose again to fulfill these scriptures. God, we thank you that we can trust in this word. So God, we just ask that you would let it, let it be done. God, we thank you for this upside down kingdom, Lord, that we are a part of. God, we praise you, Lord, for your goodness. We praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you, Lord, for the promises of your word that are yes in Christ. And the church can say amen to your promises. God, we will continue to give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. And the church said amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together for the Lord here today. First of all, I want to say happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. You've made it to Thanksgiving of 2020. (laughs) But I do want to encourage you. God God reminded me of this last night as I was getting this, and I've got tons more material that I didn't even get to. (laughs) But I was thinking to myself, I'm going to bring the word. I'm going to give them an entree. They're going to be so full, it'll be like Thanksgiving. You you ever get that way? It'll be like Thanksgiving. that They won't need to come back for another week before they need more of the word. The Holy Spirit reminded me, Chris, you are just the appetizer. That's right. 
you're just the appetizer. That's right. Would we view Sunday like that again? That this is just the appetizer. This just makes us want to dig into this word and to know this word and to know the author of this word. I believe that God wants to do something powerful in this moment in time in the church. It's only from the people who are willing to dig it out and to wrestle with the Lord. So I want to encourage you that actually this Sunday coming up, a reminder, after Thanksgiving, we're going to be having our Christmas tree lighting out here. Wrightsville Christmas tree lighting, which the students told me they cut down the Christmas tree. Is that right? (laughs) Yeah? Okay, they got a smaller one? It's not like Charlie Brown style, is it? Okay, we'll be lighting a Christmas tree then. I want to encourage you guys to come back and be a part of that. And I pray that you guys have a blessed Thanksgiving. Have a great week.